Hi everybody and welcome to this evening's Oncology webinar. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Hannah and I am Referral Coordinator here at BBS. So tonight I will be introducing our speaker for this evening, Dr Claire Nottenbelt, as she presents Canine Lymphoma, The Next Steps. For those of you who are meeting the virtual veterinary specialist for the first time this evening, welcome and we hope you enjoy this evening's webinar. Here at BVS, we have a team of friendly, knowledgeable veterinary specialists whose mission is to improve your access to specialist veterinary healthcare, increasing collaboration between first opinion vets and specialists in the industry. With our sophisticated video and diagnostic platform, we empower first opinion vets to deliver specialist level care to their own patients in their own clinics. At a time where the UK pet population continues to expand, with the availability of referral help limited at this time, the pressure on primary clinics is being felt across the country now more than ever. And we really do feel that with you. BVS specialists are on hand to support your veterinary team, your patients and their owners with affordable, timely help. From specialist-led live guided clinical workups leading to in-house diagnoses such as echoes, abdominal ultrasound and neurology examinations to advice calls available at a time that suits you. BVS integrates seamlessly into your practice. We also offer bespoke chemotherapy protocols you administer in-house, designed by Claire and tailored to your patient and practice. Our aim is to share specialist level knowledge in order to support you with all aspects of veterinary medicine. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claire Nottenbout, our CVS specialist in small animal medicine and VVS oncology advisor. Claire graduated from the University of Bristol in 1994 and worked for a year in mixed practice before starting her specialist training in small animal medicine at the University of Edinburgh's Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies. She obtained the RCVS diploma in small animal medicine in 1999, as well as a master's in transfusion medicine. Claire worked as a clinician at the University of Glasgow from 2000 and was awarded a personal professorship in small animal medicine and oncology in 2010. She was the clinical director of the University of Glasgow Small Animal Hospital for six years and worked within the university's oncology service for 11 years. We are therefore very lucky to have Claire presenting this topic for us this evening. If you do have any questions as we go through, please feel free to pop them in the chat box below as we'll finish up with the presentation with a question and answer session with Claire at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Claire. It's been a pleasure to meet you all and enjoy. Thank you. Claire? Thank you. Well, welcome everyone um, to this talk on cane line lymphoma, the next steps. Um, I was asked to give a talk on an oncology topic and actually lymphoma is one of those things that crops up a lot. It's a very, very common disease and it's very, very easy to diagnose, but it's really hard. There's a lot of things out there um, trying to tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing at certain points in time. And I think this is a topic which can be very dry in textbooks and, and and actually is such an important topic in terms of getting things right for your owners. For those of you who've not met me before, um, I try and be very down to earth and practical in the advice that I give. And so that is very much going to be the theme of tonight's talk. It's going to be about making sure that these are things that you can do out there in real life. And talking about the patients as patients far more than a cancer with a patient attached. It's really about thinking about the patient and the family in the context of their cancer. And that's really my big priority when it comes to talking about any um, canine or feline oncology problem. So first of all, let's just have a think about canine lymphoma. We know that the diagnosis is relatively straightforward. All of you will have done FNAs of, of big lymph nodes um, and taken samples and confirmed that you've got lymphoma. And of course, marked lymphadenopathy is, is really common. And for the most part, in my experience, the patients are often really well, um, you know, they'll often present either as an incidental finding where the owners found the lump, which is the lymph nodes, or they present with, um, you know, an you know it, it's literally an incidental thing at, at 
certain vaccination or something like that. And they're usually really well. And the aspirates are usually diagnostic. I have had a few cases recently where the labs have not been willing to call it. But unfortunately, in my opinion, if you've got multiple lymph nodes all over the body, really big, and they're highly suspicious of lymphoma, that for me is lymphoma. OK, um, there is sometimes that pressure to get, do more tests and, and look at more things, do another aspirate, do another aspirate. If it looks like a lymphoma, it's the right um, appearance for a lymphoma and it's high, suspicious of a lymphoma, then it probably is a lymphoma. Occasionally, however, we do need to be aware that they can also present a slightly unusual thing. So they might present as just hypercalcemia with, with PUPD. They might present as a specific organ disease where we can see changes in a single organ, particularly in things like the liver and the spleen. And in this case here, you can see also we might get a lymphoma presenting in the skin or we might see changes on bloods. And so the animal might present unwell. And then when you look at your bloods, you're seeing abnormalities um, in the white cell part, the red cells, the platelets and so forth, which might point you towards a bone marrow disorder. But what I really want to focus on today is once we've got that diagnosis, so we've done our aspirate and we know we've got lymphoma, what are the next steps? What things do we have to consider with our patients, with our clients that we're working with, that will tell us the, the, the best way forward, really, for these animals? And the first question I get asked quite a lot is, is node removal important? OK, and this is quite a big thing when you are in academia, because there's quite a lot of pressure to um, get a histological diagnosis. But actually, in real terms, in terms of managing most patients, it really isn't essential. It's perhaps important where the diagnosis is uncertain. And I touched on earlier this idea that if it's suspicious, then realistically, then that's enough for me. I don't then go and remove a node. But where they really, you, you're you highly suspicious, but your aspirate hasn't confirmed it, then removal of a node is quite a useful approach. The reason why um, in referral centres they often want to remove nodes is that this concept of, of having a much more tailored approach to lymphoma. So in humans, they define the lymphoma in a lot more kind of detail, and then they try and tailor treatment to it. Now, we're not quite in the same realms, so our treatment regimes are a little bit more limited. There are certain situations where a tailored approach can be useful, but actually in the most part, it probably isn't that useful. And the important thing to remember is that it can be costly to take out a lymph node. So that's going to add on an upfront cost before you even start thinking about your treatment. And it could delay starting treatment. So normally with any chemotherapy patient, I would wait a minimum of 10 days after surgery for the wound to fully heal before I start chemo. So if we do do this lymph node removal, we are going to be delaying treatment. And the harsh reality is it's, it's really unlikely to change the treatment options that are available. I'm going to touch on treatment options a bit later on because I think what defines the treatment options is much more patient and family based than necessarily type of lymphoma. And that might be an unpopular decision with some oncologists, but my view is patient always comes number one family, as in the, the owners and the extended family around that patient becomes number two and the cancer is number three. So we want to treat it, but we're not at the cost to those other two areas. Where there's only one lymph node affected, then that is different. So if we've only got one lymph node, OK, then that might improve survival. And this is actually a picture of a wee dog, Oliver, who I treated um, that would be about six, seven years ago now uh, with lymphoma. He only had stage two lymphoma, so it only involved a couple of lymph nodes. He actually had one of those nodes out to confirm the diagnosis. And then he did some chemotherapy, which to be fair to Oliver, didn't suit him too well. But I'm really glad to say I am still looking after him, not for lymphoma, for his, all his other problems, but not lymphoma. Um, and so there are times when removal of a node could be therapeutic. And that's perhaps slightly different from thinking of it as purely a diagnostic thing. So I hope you can see that is lymph node removal important? Probably not that essential. There are situations where it might be helpful. The next big question I get asked is, should I type 
a tumor as being either T or B cell. And as many of you know, we type for T and B to determine prognosis. And I tend to try and remember this in a simple way. That's that's my approach. I like simple ways to remember things because otherwise I find things hard to remember. So I always think T, terrible, B, better. I think we've probably gone a little bit beyond that now in terms of our options. We have more different options available. So we can treat T-cell lymphomas with different protocols. And that gives us a better chance, if you like, of inducing remission. And we might expect in a T-cell lymphoma around about six months if we use a lomistine-based regime. Whereas in the B cell lymphomas, we're going to get somewhere between seven and 11 months remission with a CHOP. And it's important that you have this conversation with owners, I think, before you start, because will spending the money on typing make a big difference to what they're going to do? And the prognosis sometimes for people does make a big difference. You know, if they think, I'm, it's only going to get maybe six months in the sort of best case scenario, they might decide not to do chemotherapy, particularly if it's going to be something like a six month protocol like the CHOP protocol. Other owners will have a different view. I did have an owner once um, who, when I said, look, you're going to get around six months, she said, well, if a dog's life is one year equals seven, seven years of our years, then three and a half years is not bad, is it? Um, and that was quite an interesting take on it. So sometimes we do this and it will alter what we're going to do. But I'll always have that conversation with the client before I go down the route of the TB cell question, because it is it is potentially a more costly way of doing things. There are different ways to achieve this. We can do um, immunohistochemistry on our fixed tissue. So if we've taken a lymph node out and we've got histopathological specimens, we can do IHC um, or we can do PAR or flow cytometry on things like aspirates, blood or other fluid. So it's worth just liaising with the lab, make sure you've got the right kind of samples for the right kind of tests that you're gonna do. But bear in mind that sometimes this can also cause quite a big treatment delay. So I've seen patients where people are waiting for a result to decide is it T or B cell and they can be waiting a week or even two weeks sometimes for things like PAR to come back and really you need to act a little bit faster than that so it might be that these tests are running whilst you're already making decisions about where to go with the chemotherapy. So is it essential? No, it's not essential. It might help you decide prognosis and it might help you tailor treatment appropriately, but not an essential part for these clients to have to have this. So what about staging the patient? So when um, you read textbooks, they always talk about staging and staging, I do think is important. Um, it usually entails full bloods and obviously full bloods are going to be needed before we start any treatment anyway. So that's a, a really big asset. It's going to involve some form of chest imaging. For me, that's normally just straightforward radiographs and often you're going to see lymph nodes enlarged in the chest. That's kind of to be expected. Until recently, I would have said I hardly ever see anything else in the chest, but just recently I've had a wee dog whose main presenting problem was chest abnormalities and it's got lymphoma and treating it, um, we actually used a lomistine based protocol in that dog. Um, it's done really well and it's doing really well and all the respiratory symptoms have resolved. And that's that kind of shocks me because it, it really has been hundreds and hundreds of cases that I've taken chest imaging in and I've never seen actual kind of parenchymal changes. I've seen node enlargement and so forth. Abdominal ultrasound, this allows us to assess if the, the liver and the spleen are involved and that will tell us the, the upper, you know, the level of the stage, um, but also it will tell us if we're likely to have more of a problematic remission, if you like. So if your patient only has liver lymphoma, then that is pretty bad. And we know that they have a very poor response rate to treatment. We can also do bone marrow biopsy and or aspirates. Um, again, when I worked at the university, this was very much kind of drummed into us. You must do this. You must do this. Um, my personal view on this is again is it really essential possibly not um, if you've already seen some changes in the bloods then you can probably infer from that that there may well be stage five involvement it's not necessarily going to change the the treatment that we give um, if we prove that that is what's going on but obviously it does change the prognosis so again it's about having that 
conversation with the owners, how much do they want to do? And doing the full staging, if you do everything that's on this list, that can significantly add to the cost. And so this, we need to be clear with owners what this is trying to achieve. If we've got multicentric lymphadenopathy, then we know that already we've got a stage three. If then we see liver and spleen, we've got a stage four. And then if we've got bone marrow, we've got a stage five. OK, and in general terms, you can say that higher stages have shorter survival times, so it can be useful again for helping owners decide how much they want to put the dog through. Um, but the reality is that it doesn't change what we can do, so it doesn't change our treatment options. But what it can do is identify other underlying diseases. And so in that context, it may be useful. Now, I have run a number of patients where finances have been limited without any staging, and for the most part, they've gone really well, apart from one just in the last week, um, which was a dog that presented with severe hypercalcemia, lots and lots of lymph node enlargement, owner declined additional staging, we started it on steroids, and it didn't do well, and on Monday, it was scanned for this reason, and its whole abdomen was just a wipeout. I mean, it, it, all its lymph nodes were up, its intestines looked abnormal, and it was showing no response to the treatment whatsoever. So do I wish I'd staged that one? Possibly. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it might have delayed the treatment further. So I don't know if it would have meant the outcome would have changed. But you always I, I don't know about you guys, but certainly whenever I deal with any cases, if, if there's been something that my decision perhaps wasn't didn't get the outcome that I wanted, I'll always look back and try and say, right, OK, would I have done something differently And in the next case? So I, I, I try not to be too hard on myself because obviously in life you make a decision based on the knowledge that you have at that moment. And so you can't go back and go, oh, I'm terrible because I didn't do that. But you can go back and say, OK, with the knowledge that I had then, would it have changed the outcome if I had had done these procedures? And I, I don't think it would have for that patient, sadly. I think he was he was really far gone, unfortunately, by the time we started treatment. But do remember, if you do have circulating lymphoma cells already on your bloods, then it's stage five. So what's the bone marrow really going to add? It's going to add nothing. And again, it has that potential to delay what you're doing. So the next question I then have with owners is, is what about our treatment options? And obviously this is the thing they really want to jump to quite quickly. They want to talk about treatment options because they're in shock and they want to know what you can do for their pet. So I always start with talking about the survival times for no treatment. And this comes as quite a shock to people when you say it's around four to six weeks. Now it's really interesting this four to six weeks because for the first thing, we don't know when it was diagnosed. So if you've got a patient that comes in and it's a routine vaccine check, there's nothing wrong with it, and you notice the nodes are big, the owners haven't noticed the nodes are big, that's a really fit, healthy animal with an abnormality. That would, will clearly have a better survival with no treatment than a dog that's presented off its food, severely hypercalcemic, you know, got severe diarrhea, you know, just, just looks terrible. It's not gonna live six weeks. So these figures really are highly dependent on the moment that the patient actually presents. I think also it's it's really interesting because these kind of figures stem from a long time ago. You know, I, I, I tried to get the original papers related to this a couple of years back when I was trying to do a knowledge summary on steroid use in lymphoma. And it's actually very difficult to find real data. And, you know, people in practice probably have more access to the real data on this side of things than people in referral hospitals do, because in referral hospitals, we've got the patients that really want the treatment. The next option, of course, is prednisolone on its own, and this gives a range of around two to three months. However, and it's a big however, there are situations reported in the literature where patients have gone on for a long time on steroids alone. And for myself, I had a patient that had gone through a CHOP and then was sent home because they couldn't afford any more treatment, sent home on steroids. Um, you know, we were expecting two to three months. And that dog pitched up in the waiting room two years later to see the ophthalmology specialist. It was, of course, the size of a small table by this point. Um, but we were like, laddie, how can you still be alive? That's not possible. But when you look through the literature, there are reports of long survivals on steroids alone, but that's 
also coupled with quite short survivals on steroids alone as well. So that's why the median still sits around this two to three months. We don't really know how much steroids to give. Do we go hard and long and do, you know, two mix per kick indefinitely? Do we wean them off it a little bit? We don't really know. And it is really, really important to remember that steroid side effects can be really significant in dogs. This is a, a dog, Jerry, who I treated a few years back. And you can see he's just got massive muscle wasting. Um, and, and I perhaps was a little bit blasé about the side effects of steroids until I put my own dog on steroids. And oh my God, it was awful. Drinking lots, peeing everywhere, peeing in the house, panting at night, wanting food all the time. Horrific. OK, so I think that made me much more aware of the steroid side effects. Yes, I talked about them to clients, but I didn't really get how disruptive they can be. And for many people, choosing the steroid only route is the route they want to take because they want to avoid chemotherapy side effects. So it's really important that we're very clear that the steroids have side effects. In fact, in my experience, some dogs have far worse side effects with the first period of steroids in the protocols than they do at any other point in the whole protocol. So it is really important to address that. If we go down the route of chemotherapy, we're going to get a range of, survival, of remission times and possibly survival times. So when we talk about remission times, this is the kind of time that we're going to expect when we've got it under control. And then there's going to be, if you like, the four to six weeks after that where the dog deteriorates. Now, obviously, sometimes you can see there's a range here. We may get relapse during treatment. We may get relapse some months after treatment, and that's highly variable. And owners always want to know the dates and the times, but I don't think they really understand what median means, that median is a mishmash of all of these. You know, we're just going in the middle. This is what most patients will get. And actually, there's going to be a group that get a lot less, and there's going to be a group that gets some more than that okay and also it's worth talking to them about the possibility of reinduction so reinduction is where we would give the same protocol again or rescue and rescue is where we failed to get induction okay so say we have reinduced with the CHOP for the second time it's not working and then we're coming back in with a different protocol and adding that in and we need to be aware for clients. I mean, they don't really need to know the difference between reinduction and rescue. What they need to know is we can try something else or we can try the same again, depending on the time frame. But every time we try something else, the chance is kind of half. And I was listening to a great talk recently by David Vale, and he says, really, you've got to tell owners that every time you use a protocol, the next time you go on to something, it's going to be about half. The next time it's going to be half again. So every time you add a new regime and a new different change, you're not expecting to get the full remission that you were getting from the initial program, if you like, of, of treatment. So how do clients decide on the best treatment option? And in my experience, owners really want to focus on the risk of side effects. OK, that that's their big thing. Oh, what's the side effects going to be? They've often had experiences of people being on chemotherapy and horrific side effects or they've seen it on the telly um, and it tends to put them off. But in reality, for me, I want to consider different things. And this is why I try and encourage them to think about the key criteria that we need to apply to their individual patient, okay? Because actually I can't predict what their individual patient will do in terms of side effects. I can tell them about side effects and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later, but I can't predict it. What we can do is we can try and predict which regime is going to be most suitable to the patient. So is your pet, your dog going to be nice like this little Jack Russell here and sit and have its IV lie in place? Or is it going to be a complete psychopathic loon? In which case, that's going to be very difficult for everyone involved, okay? I have treated psychopathic loons um, with injectable chemo and yeah, it's, it's immensely challenging. And at times I have actually questioned whether it's the right thing to do for that patient. So for me, will the patient be okay coming to the vets regularly or will they just be getting stressed? Will it be stressful for everyone concerned? Because if it is, then really, why are we attempting that?
We also need to think hard about budget because when you're looking at like a CHOP protocol, you're talking about £6,000 realistically start to finish, possibly more in the southern parts of the UK compared to the northern parts of the UK. And if you don't have that budget, then that's okay. We can try something else and we have different options. And that's something that I like working with people on and looking at what realistic budgets are and whether actually it's better to use a different protocol that is more budget friendly. Yes, it might not get the same outcome, but it's not going to mean a sort of second mortgage and, and these kind of problems. We also need to think about the practicalities of regular vet visits um, in terms of how the animal is going to cope with it how the owner is going to get them there and very important we need to talk about the health and safety implications for family members okay so um, as you know when patients are on chemotherapy they're excreting toxic byproducts in poo in wee in vomit and in their saliva so this little child here snuggled up to the golden retriever which i'm not sure is a great plan at the best of times chemotherapy aside but they are rubbing themselves if you like against the coat of that dog and the coat of that dog will be potentially contaminated after each chemo treatment okay normally i say to people seven days but actually the different treatments do have slightly different days so in the context of, of challenging health and safety situations i can help advise on how we deal with that with different drug options as well but if you've got pregnant women in the house, pregnant woman or a breastfeeding mother or, you know, very young children, it may be that some of these options are just not right for that, that context. So whilst they will focus on the side effects, we really need to consider these parameters instead. The next big question, and actually where you guys can really, really help in this situation is, can the owners travel to get chemotherapy or can they get it done locally? And for me, this is one of my biggest bugbears, okay? Um, because actually having a dog with cancer is incredibly stressful. I know this myself because I went through it myself with my own dog and it's emotionally exhausting. And then we're asking people to drive halfway across the country, maybe for two hours each way, having to take a day off work. That is tough. That is financially tough and it's emotionally tough as well. And I think that the key thing here is to remember that chemotherapy can be done safely in any vet practice. OK, so if you're not doing chemotherapy already, it's really important that you review that decision and find a way to do it to support your clients. Because if they can't have it locally, they need to bear in mind the fact that they're going to have to travel. They're going to have to go to a referral hospital, which is likely to be a lot more expensive. Certainly round by me, a lot of people have to travel from the islands. So I had one client who was literally catching a ferry from the Isle of Skye and then driving for like three hours to get to the vet school and then having its chemo. And we had to finish its chemo between 12 and one because at one o'clock they had to drive back to catch the ferry so they could get home the same day. So for us up here in quite a rural part of the world, there's long distance is involved and potentially even ferry journeys. For those of you more in the south, there's traffic jams and you know the challenges of just getting around when there's a lot of traffic. So it's quite stressful for owners having to travel. Some pets, as you know, don't travel very well and they're going to need to take time off work. And I've had clients literally in my consult room crying because they've run out of time to take off work because they didn't expect their dog to live as long and need so much chemo, which is, you know, success, but it's not that successful, is it, when they're really upset? So we don't want that. If they are traveling and you are, you know, sending away your patients to get chemotherapy at a, a remoter location, are they going to get their side effects managed there as well? Because we need to think about that. Will they be able to get their any side effects managed locally? Or will they have to still commute if there are any potential side effects as well? And then we also have to ask ourselves, what's the impact on the pet's quality of life of what we're putting them through? So if the dog really hates traveling, it vomits every time it travels, then is that fair to get them to travel just to have the chemo? So it's really important we think about the logistical planning around this the practicalities of the family you know is it always going to be the same person that brings the dog or is it going to be different people and how are they going to factor that in to their lives 
So the next question is always owners want to say, which chemotherapy regime is the best, you know, because they want to know the best for their dog. They want the best for them. And I really kind of say, well, OK, this comes back to the logistics. Can you genuinely make the regular visits required by a chop or a cop? So for me, chop is the best in terms of survival times, but it does require regular visits and it does require regular IVs. We can tweak the chop a little bit. So I tend to use an extended chop, which is the 26 week one. Um, and that basically involves once you've done two cycles, you're going to move on to every two weeks. Now, I've always done it that way. And owners seem grateful to have that period where they have week on, week off after the first two cycles. But a lot of other places will do the 19 week chop, which is just basically where you just press on and keep doing weekly chemos, basically. Um, and that means it's over quicker, but it can be difficult for clients if they are having to take time off. So I think the 26 week works particularly well if they kind of want a break. In terms of outcome, it doesn't make a massive difference to the patient either way. We can also think about reducing the frequency of the visits by using single agents. Now, as you know, using a single agent is not going to be as effective as using a multi-agent protocol. But if we use single agents, we can then only have to see the patient every three weeks. Can they get an IV line? If they can't, then we're going to have to rule out our CHOP, our COP, we're going to have to rule out our infusions, our doxorubicin, epirubicin, mitoxantrone, but we could still be thinking about a lomistine. And actually, I did have a patient a few years back who was a rescue dog, and it wouldn't let you handle the dog. If the owner held the head up, I could do a jugular blood sample, but I could not touch any other part of the dog's body, basically. It was very difficult. I could just about feel his submand that flows to the side whether he's in remission or not, and that was it. But the owner could throw a lomacine tablet at the dog and it would catch it like a treat and swallow it down. So it was possible for us to treat that dog. Also, we need to consider the budget. I touched on earlier that the CHAP protocol, you're looking at around about £6,000 for that. But if they've got a limited budget, then we can look at cheaper alternatives. So single agent lomastine is usually one of the cheaper options. COP can be cheaper, but only if they don't live longer than 12 months, because after that, you, then you've kind of balanced out the CHOP because of the length of time that you're just constantly giving them chemo and constantly placing IVs. So it's going to vary a lot between different patients, very small dogs that need reformulated lomastine. It can work out quite costly compared to large dogs who can get the 40 mig lomastine. So that is going to be a factor as well. It's also really important to remember that the question, the answer, if you like, the answer to this question may change during treatment or at rescue. It may be that the budget changes. It may be that the patient changes. And I find that they can kind of go either way. They can get really chilled with chemo and really mellow about it and just like, yeah, whatever. Um, I've been doing this so long. I know the game. I'm totally chilled. Or they can become really upset by it. And for the most part, it's the former. But occasionally I'll see patients who where I've had to literally because they've been quite aggressive dogs, have to sedate them every time. And in that situation, it does just beg the question, is this still the best approach for this patient? OK, because because actually what we want is for them to have really, really good quality time. We want them to be out and about running in the countryside, enjoying their family and so forth. And that's our, our main focus for these patients. So what is best is highly patient dependent and budget dependent as well. So another big question people always ask is, what if my dog is is on non -steroidals? You know, it's got arthritic problems and it really needs to stay on non -steroidals. Well, this is quite interesting because actually there's been a recent study looking at this and it found that using a CHOP without prednisolone had no difference in the outcomes. Does that mean I would always not use steroids? Absolutely not, because I think steroids are a really important stalwart to inducing that initial remission. They also help us control the, the white cell side of things. So it keeps the neutrophil count reasonably high. But if you've got a patient that absolutely cannot come off um, non-steroidals, then it is possible to avoid the use of steroids. 
obviously we're still early days and the whole labrella side of things and so it might be that actually we could use labrella and not need to use the NSAIDs anymore but I think it's still too early to know exactly whether that's feasible or not and what the interaction would be between labrella and other things I've not really personally had a lot of experience using the two things together yet so we have to just wait and see but the good news is that the evidence supports pulling out the steroids if we need to for a particular reason say a dog won't tolerate steroids then we can avoid using steroids and we should be able to get a similar outcome so what about managing your adverse event effects you know this was the question that the owners asked right at the beginning oh what are the side effects going to be and it's really important to be clear with them that most dogs for, on chemotherapy for lymphoma do not get adverse side effects okay but the first time you give any drug you do not know the outcome okay and there are a number of possible side effects so i'll always always go through these with the client and um, they always kind of expect the gi side effects of the anorexia the vomiting and the diarrhea because that's what they've either experienced through chemos with family members or themselves or they've seen on the telly um, in dramas when people are going through chemo they can also get obviously myelosuppression and in my experience in the most part the myelosuppressive side effects of chemotherapy really don't cause the patient a lot of hassle they just cause the vets and the owners a lot of hassle occasionally you'll get a patient that gets really sick with myelosuppression um, but you know literally we we built a neutropenic ward when I was at Glasgow and for the first like five years we never actually had a patient in it um, so it is actually a very uncommon problem and then, of course, we've got drug specific side effects. So I'll take the owners through all of these, go through the potential side effects and then talk about the drug specific side effects, because that will help them maybe decide which protocol is right for their patient. In my experience, patients who are prone to gastrointestinal upset are probably more likely to have GI side effects. OK, there's no hard data to support that. But certainly, you know, animals who've had regular GI side effects, I do worry that they're going to be perhaps a little bit more sensitive. And in my experience, doxorubicin commonly causes gastrointestinal side effects, particularly diarrhea. OK, but Please bear in mind that sometimes it can be a bit of a red herring. I had one dog who started, had its first dose of doxorubicin, got severe diarrhea. The owner was like, no, we're never doing that again. That was just awful. And we were like, well, are you sure? Because, you know, we can maybe manage it. And they said, no, no, no. But actually, we did a culture on that dog's um, hemorrhagic diarrhea, and it actually had Campylobacter. So maybe that was the reason, maybe the doxo had caused the Campylobacter to kind of come back out again and, and, and cause problems, or maybe it was completely unrelated. We don't know. They had already made up their mind. They didn't want to do it. Vincristine can also cause gastrointestinal upsets in some patients, more common in cats than dogs in my experience. But if that happens, we can substitute with Vimplastin. The doses are different, though, so don't just do a straight substitution. It's a, different, it's a different dose for the two drugs. But actually, by substituting drugs, um, we can really help with side effects. So if we're having a, a regular problem with a particular drug, I would definitely recommend substitutions. We can also use supportive treatment. Um, I tend to always give my clients meropotent when they're discharged with the after the first chemo, but I don't use it routinely. And that's perhaps a little bit different from some oncologists. My view is a lot of dogs do not need those drugs. And if we just give it, we just mask it. And in addition, we don't then know which of the drugs are causing more problems to the patient. And for the big infusions, we don't know when the problem starts. So I usually say to them, look, if usually your doctor has some GI side effects going to be around about five days. Um, so let's see how it goes. If in five days it's starting to go off its food, we'll, we'll use meropotent. And then the next time we use Doxto, I'm going to come in with meropotent on day four so that it's fully covered before day five. So that's the way I prefer to do it so that we're not just throwing lots of drugs at these patients. Also, sometimes we might need a dose reduction. So it's good to know the situation we find ourselves in, if you like, without these drugs in the first instance. Um, but if owners are really paranoid about side effects, then you could just blanket treat. And some oncologists believe that that is the best way forward. But bear in mind that does add considerably to the cost because you're going to be giving four days of, of Serenia tablets, for example, that can significantly add up if you're doing that every time you give a chemo treatment. 
If we're dealing with diarrhea, then we've got options of using like easy pill smectate, which is basically like a binder. And normally it's something we, we hide pills in. Um, we can use protexin or metronidazole. And there's quite a lot of data that says that the easy pill smectate um, is just as good as anything else at actually controlling the diarrhea. In fact, it probably speeds up control a bit faster than even metronidazole. And as I said, just bear in mind, though, sometimes these symptoms will be unrelated to chemotherapy. So I had that dog with the, the respiratory lymphoma I was talking about earlier. It had a really rough time after its first dose of lomacine. And I was quite shocked because normally I think of lomacine as being pretty easy. And I had a long conversation with the clients and said, look, do you want to carry on? And they were like, no, no, we want to carry on. And I said, do you want to dose reduce? No, no, we'll try again. We, we think it was unrelated. We think it might have been that she ate something because she's been so hungry on a stem. Steroids. And so with a slightly heavy heart, I said, right, OK, let's go for it. And actually, she's just sailed through since then. So it's really important to just bear in mind that it's not always the chemo that's causing the side effects. And in my experience, you'll get some clients who mentally decide that it's always the chemo. OK, um, they've already decided they may have been a bit negative about it. Maybe one partner wanted to do chemo and the other one didn't. And then you get other ones who keep telling you that the dog is fine. And then when you actually ask them, it turns out that they're vomiting all over the place. They've got diarrhea the whole week. It's awful. So just bear in mind that, that clients will tell you the story they, they kind of want to tell you. And it's up to us to make sure that we're actually getting the real facts, background facts to it. But also supporting them. There's just no point fighting them. If they want to stop, they need to stop. The next big one is managing myelosuppression. And the easiest way we can do that is just obviously by doing hematology before every chemo treatment. And in pretty much every situation I'll do that, I have had occasional patients where money has been extremely limited. And in that situation, if we're using a low dose COP protocol, then it is possible to restrict your bloods so after the first kind of wee while, once you've kind of got into the rhythm of it and you know what you're doing and you know the effect that the drugs are having on the, the bone marrow and the, the bloods, then you can cut back and, and reduce the numbers of times you do hematology. And in the past, when I've done that, I've kind of done every second dose. Um, we've done a hematology. It is a high risk option. And it's really important that the owners are understanding of that, that they're not going to kind of rage if you make a mistake and you've given chemo when the, the counts are too low. You're doing it as a compromise solution because of finances. OK, so that's the key thing there. Now, I have set cutoffs that I tend to use for chemo. So I will say if the um, neutrophils are more than three, if the plates are greater than 150 and if the hematocrit has anything that's just a sort of mild to moderate anemia, because this is actually really common in, in chemo patients, I'll fire ahead. Some oncologists you'll see using any figures greater than, than two, some greater than 2.5. So for me, between the two and the three, I will kind of look at the patient and I will also look at where we went last time. So for me, I like to keep a summary sheet of what the bloods were before we started treatment and then at each time we check them. So I can go, oh look, yeah, you know, last time we gave them Christine, um, the count went from 14 to three. So now when the count is three, I'm going to be a little bit concerned. It's still within the bounds, um, but I'm going to be perhaps a little bit concerned that we might be really gonna drop this, okay? But equally, if it went from 14 to um, 10, and then it's sitting at three, I'm thinking, you know what, as a percentage change, that's not gonna be a big percentage change. I think I can risk it, okay? So trust your instincts a little bit. It's easy to give really precise figures, but it's not, you know, you have to trust your own understanding of that individual pet because, you know, for example, I've got a greyhound and greyhounds um, that when they're on chemo, they start with quite a low count. So we need to look at where they're starting and where they're moving to. So really think about it in the context of the patient not just in a general term of oh yeah you know if it's between two and three it needs some sort of adjustment and I don't know what you know just just pause for a moment and see if we do need to dose reduce them then we can take out you know 10% dose reductions we can delay and that's an area that we can help you with so you know you'll find that once you do a few of these you'll get a bit more confident at making those kind of decisions yourself but in the the shorter term the medium term we can help you with that. We can support you in making those kind of decisions to chemo or not to chemo or to dose reduce or not to dose reduce in those situations. 
On the plus side, if you do get neutropenia, the patient usually remains really well. OK, so the majority of my patients that have been neutropenic, you wouldn't know to look at them. OK, and for the positives, if they do get neutropenia, they often get a more rapid remission and they stay in remission longer. So I present this as a positive to the clients, you know, when they come in and they're disappointed because the pet's neutropenic and they can't get their chemo. I'm like, you know what? They do better. And the thinking behind this is because effectively we're treating the cancer more harshly. So they have gone neutropenic because actually we're killing things fairly effectively. And, and that's a good thing. But it's really important to bear in mind that neutropenia can cause delays. So we don't want to be inducing neutropenia like consciously saying, OK, let's go with making a more neutropenic to get a better outcome, because then you're going to get a delay. And once you get a delay, you may get a worse outcome. So it's this constant kind of balancing act. And I always, always tell people that it could cause hospitalization. It is extremely rare. I mean, honestly, in a referral hospital, I think we had, how many years did I work on oncology? 11 years. I can remember about three patients that had to be hospitalized for their neutropenia. Okay. And that's because even when their counts are low, they're actually quite well. And my philosophy is, well, if they're really well, are they better in a hospital or are they better at home, away from other patients and away from potentially hospital and acquired infections? And for me, tends to be get them home unless they're sick and they need IV antibiotics. If they're unwell with it or the count is less than one, then we have to maybe rethink that. But again, we can help advise on that if, if it's a specific patient. And I think it's, it's easy to make generalizations, but it needs to be based on the patient and then deciding. So, you know, please reach out if we can help you in that respect. When we talk about specific side effects, um, we have to think about specific drugs. And as many of you will know, doxorubicin can cause cardiomyopathy. So I do recommend that you check for occult cardiomyopathy using um, a cardiac scan. And obviously the VVS team can help you with that if that's something you need support with. And then I'll usually reassess that after four doses. Now, you might say, well, Claire, four doses takes you to the end of your CHOP protocol. Why do I need to reassess it? Well, we may need to reinduce in the future and we need to know, could we use DOXO again? But also, if we are seeing occult changes, we may need to think about addressing that and managing that and monitoring that as we move forward, because we don't want to save it from one disease to give it another disease. The risk is much higher in the large breed dogs. So this is absolutely essential in the large breeds that are prone to occult DCM particularly. And there's a simple substitution we can do if we do find there are changes that make this impossible. We can substitute with either epirubicin or with mitoxantrone. So for me, it's not compulsory to do echocardiography. So again, this is a place where we could save some money if we need to save money, but it is recommended. So I do suggest that you talk to the client and you give them the pros and the cons of doing it. OK, the con being the cost, the pro being the safety side of things. And obviously, even if we substitute, we may want to use DOXO as a single agent as a rescue regime if we haven't used it in the primary protocol. With cyclophosphamide, we tend to see a hemorrhagic cystitis. And the way I get around this now, it's, it's something that's widely used, is to give frizomide with every single dose of cyclophosphamide. And this significantly reduces the risk of hemorrhagic cystitis. Because if you have had any patient with hemorrhagic cystitis, it is awful. I mean, it does make me wonder why we haven't considered changing from using cyclophosphamide to something else, say melphalan, which we often substitute it for in the early stages. Why do we use cyclo? But anyway, we use cyclo. We do it a lot. And it's all it's out there. It's in the data. So it's really, really important that you check for occult hematuria. Now, this is a dipstick. So this is a cheap check. And it is really, really important, OK, because you can see hemorrhagic cystitis even on small doses of cyclophosphamide. And these patients are often in a lot of discomfort and it's really hard to get under control. So do not use cyclophosphamide if there is any evidence of hematuria at any point. So we'll do a dipstick before we give it. And then I'll usually recommend a dipstick after each treatment. So when they come in for their next dose, you check it. For the COP, where they're getting it really regularly, you need to be doing regular urine samples. Any sign of hematuria, you must stop immediately, even if there are no clinical signs of cystitis. Really, really important because it is a nasty condition once you've got it. 
Lomacine, we touched on earlier, great tablet only regime for that great dog. He was called Prince, Prince Cool, his name was. The surname was Cool, his name was Prince. I've always remembered it because he was Prince Cool, which is a pretty cool name. And it's important with Lomacine to remember that it can cause hepatotoxicity. So you must always check your ALT and your ALP before you give the dose, okay? And this is a little dog down here that you can see um, basically it was on some steroids, okay, so its ALP was up, um, but after it had its lomacine, we got a substantial increase in ALT, and that is really a problem, okay? We're going to have to potentially, in this patient, stop using lomacine. You can support them by um, using SAMI supplements, so that's your, your Denamarins, your Samalins and so forth, um, for either 10 days after each lomacine is given or throughout the whole protocol, but again, that adds a lot to the cost. And if we're using this as one of our cheaper options, this can be a significant um, problem. We can also play around with dose um, and we can also um, change our frequency. So we can sort of going from every three weeks, we can maybe get to every four weeks. But in situations where the ALT goes high, like in this patient where it's, you know, it's basically quadrupled after a dose, we have to be really, really careful and it may require total withdrawal. Of course, you've got to balance that with if this is the only treatment that the dog can get for lymphoma, for whatever reason, then you have to warn the owners, look, I'm, I'm damaging its dog's liver here and it could die from that, but it could die from the lymphoma if we stop it and we don't have any alternatives. So in the situation where there are no alternatives, then that may be all you can do. And I'm a firm believer that we can't always do perfection. We often have to do the best we can in the context, but we have to be open and honest about it. So we have to say, okay, this is bad. We shouldn't probably be continuing, but we have no choice and keep the owner on board with you when you're doing that. So the next big contentious issue is, do we need Nadir hematology samples? And in my opinion, I say they are not essential. You'll see a lot of oncologists like them because they tell you, they allow you to tweak the dose. But given that most of my patients who present with neutropenia are not unwell, the majority of them are really, really well, the only thing I'm really gonna do differently if I see a low count is if there is a problem with that. So if the patient is sick. So in this sort of context, obviously in this patient that you can see here, that's a pretty low count, okay? Um, and so we might want to change things. But I'm going to change it if I see a low count when I actually get them back in. So Nadia checks are something we often use in the three-week protocols or people have often used. I don't often use them. So you'll get them in at around about 10 days after Doxo or 10 days after Lomastine, you'll look at a Nadia check. But I just think, is it a great idea to bring a dog with a low neutrophil count into the vet? So I'm not, you know, if it's well, if it's sick, fair enough, we're going to check it. And then we're going to say, oh, yeah, look, at it's at the deer. OK, and also the deer checks add considerably to the cost. So you've got a cost of a hematology and a cost of a visit as well. So it adds substantially to the cost. So for me, I don't do them routinely. Other oncologists out there do. And so you, you, you get advice from other people. You may get people going, oh, yeah, you must do an idea check. You're not going to get that advice from me unless we're having lots of problems. Um, and even then, I'm thinking, do you know what? I'm going to make that decision at the three week point, not at the 10 day point. I'm going to see where it's at at three weeks. So we've got through our chemo protocol um, and we're at the end of it. Do we need to restage during the protocol? Do we need to restage after the protocol? This is important where lymphoma involves only the internal organs. So where, for example, you've just got liver or just got spleen or just got kidney, then obviously the only way to know if you've achieved remission is to re-scan. Re and look for the changes. So that dog I talked to you about earlier with the lung changes, very unusual dog. We're going to be taking some chest x-rays soon um, to see whether the changes have gone. It's still on chemo at the moment. We're gonna see if they have the changes actually resolved because that's gonna help us later on when it relapses to be able to see if the changes have come back again. So if the changes have resolved now and then they come back, then that's gonna tell us, okay, disease is back. 
if the changes haven't resolved, but the dog is clinically well, then it may be that they're not, those changes are not going to resolve, either they're not related to the lymphoma, or then they're, they're kind of old damage that's not going to specifically resolve. So that can be quite useful. And obviously, in those situations, we're going to look for occurrence through, say, scanning the liver, scanning the spleen, scanning the kidneys. OK, but for my opinion, the multicentric patient, the typical peripheral lymph node enlargement, I will monitor them monthly with with lymph node palpation once they have completed their protocol. We used to do full staging. Um, that was something we did at the vet school a lot. We'd restage them and then we'd restage them every three months. And then we were like, well, that's kind of quite a long gap, isn't it? You know, they could relapse in between. And then we were thinking we're also spending a a, a shed load of money restaging all the time and actually then they don't have any money anyway to do the treatment so what's the point of spending all the money on doing tests that means they can't spend the money on doing the treatment so it's about weighing that up but for me regular lymph node checks is absolutely fine unless you've got an internal abnormality that you need to monitor and keep an eye on and in that situation check it while they're on treatment and apparently in remission and then check it probably every three months if it's things like chest x-rays and abdo scan unless it can be scanned you know conscious in which case yeah if the owner's up for it you could scan that liver every every month if you wanted to so what about repeat testing you know those lymph nodes come up so you've been checking your lymph nodes every month and then ping they come up in my opinion most cases don't need a repeat aspirate or repeat staging because we know we're going to get quite a short period of time. We're going to get half probably the amount we got last time when we either reinduce or use rescue therapy. But again, we still have this issue of is there any concurrent disease? So I'll talk to the clients about it. But again, it's by no means essential to do a full um, staging and to re repeat aspirates of the lymph nodes. If it was a lymphoma before and the lymph nodes have got massively big again, then it's going to be a lymphoma again in, in all likelihood. What we don't know is sometimes, you know, we used to talk at the uni about aspirating nodes when they were in remission and whether we'd see residual disease. And we did sometimes see some residual disease. So, you know, it's really difficult to know whether that actually adds much to it. If clinically they're relapsing, then they're probably relapsing. It can add significantly to the cost, so let's just weigh that up with what the client can actually do if we want to go down the rescue route. Blood tests are, however, essential. So if you want to do a rescue regime, you are going to have to do blood tests before you start so that you can be safe with the chemotherapy. So that is a really essential part. So hopefully um, tonight, what I've tried to show you is there are a lot of questions that we have to answer in the context of the patient, okay? We need to tailor those decisions to make it a lot easier for the clients and the patients. We need to take into account the finances. We need to take into account how long the patient might go on for and how long those finances can, can be used, if you like. You don't want to be spending it all in the first sort of six weeks and have nothing left. And the most important thing is that they can live a normal life. They need to be able to live a dog's life. They need to be able to play. They need to be able to walk. They need to have a good quality of life. And what we as vets need to do is try and balance all the things that we can do with all the things that perhaps we should or shouldn't do and think about patient first, owner second, and cancer third. And that's absolutely the way I like to deal with things. So thank you for listening. I hope that's been useful and you've got some insights and I'm really happy to, to take any questions. Thank you very much, Claire. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, I found it really interesting when you were discussing your experience with your own dog on steroids, because I think that's it's really important to remember. Actually, it's OK to to say these protocols that need to be continued at home, but then to actually live them is a totally different thing. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks. So I've um, we've got some time for questions now. You can either submit on the chat box below at the bottom of your screen uh, or feel free to send us a message on one of the WhatsApp groups that we have with your practice. Um, we have a question that's come in. Claire, um, so they've said, we have a few team members who 
who are reluctant for us to offer chemo in practice due to that health and safety reasons, for example, but they would really like to start and other colleagues would as well. Would you have any suggestions for how to make them feel more comfortable and safe uh, introducing chemotherapy into the practice? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really common problem. And I think a lot of it has stemmed from people seeing chemotherapy in referral hospitals where they're using fume hoods and everyone's like, we need a fume hood. Um, basically, it, there are so many great closed systems available to you. Um, my The one I prefer to use is the Chemoclave system, um, which is basically really easy. OK, it's a screw together system, um, but there are also um, the Facial system and there's a new system coming out from Teva. OK, and these are designed to be really, really safe. OK, interestingly, I'm, I'm doing a talk for the Teva gang uh, next month and they say that the veterinary profession is so far advanced over medics in terms of health and safety. We are just light years ahead of what's going oh, wow. on in the, in the medical profession. Um, but I think it's really important to address those concerns head on and to, you know, first of all, you don't need everybody to be able to do it. Um, the process we work, we really support your practice to do it. And in my opinion, lots of people can do it. So nurses can administer chemo, vets can administer chemo. So we can share the work out. We can make sure that every member of the practice is comfortable. And obviously, situations like where you're pregnant or you're planning pregnancy, obviously you're not going to do it. But there are simple systems now to make it really safe. It's not dangerous. I mean, when I first started doing chemo, OK, it was on the consulting room table with the owner holding the dog off a needle. I mean, it was horrendous. I don't know what I, I don't even know what I was thinking. Um, but obviously, that's not how we do it anymore. And people are paranoid because of the whole fume hood thing. But you can also buy ready drawn up products. And so actually, the health and safety risk is really small because of that. You know, even in these big hospitals where you're doing multiple chemos a day, it's a really small risk. And for you guys out in practice, you're not going to be doing 10 or 15 patients in one day. You're going to probably be doing maybe one a week, you know, at most. So, yeah. yeah. So don't, you know, reach out. And if I can help in any way, do a little CPD on health and safety, that sort of thing, then just just ask for help. Yeah, I think that's really important as well. You know, we are here any time for we can set up CPD, arrange any sessions that you need to help you feel comfortable to introduce these protocols into your practices. So thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, how do you rule out or in indolent lymphoma? OK, so indolent lymphoma is one of these things where often when you get the aspirate, you're going to get an equivocal re result. OK, so they often present slightly differently. So their lymph nodes tend to sort of be much more slow growing and more static. They're not progressive in the same way. They're often very, very well. So that is a situation where you're probably going to get on your aspirate, you're going to get a slightly more equivocal response and your lymph nodes are not behaving necessarily in the, the kind of traditional way. You might only have one or two nodes up. Um, the ones that I've seen generally, they've they've kind of, you know, you've, you've actually, they're smaller nodes and they just kind of sit there and they don't do very much. And in that situation, I would take a node out if we're not getting an, an answer for it. But with the typical ones, you're getting wumph. OK, and you're getting multiple nodes. And actually, in one case, I had such a cool case. It had lymph nodes down the back of its neck. You could even feel those. That was so wow. awesome. Mm. Um, not, not for the dog, obviously, <laughs> but well, awesome dog. to feel. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, you can judge if you're if you're seeing a slow progression and you tend to find that the indolent ones are like that. It's a much slower. It may be quite localized as well, just to kind of areas like just often submans. They're the ones that I've seen where you just have your submans and they're just kind of sitting there and they're not doing very much. So by the time your aspirates have come back, say, two or three days later, there's not been that dramatic change versus the other ones where they're kind of going, oh, you know, they're getting bigger and bigger. Thank you. Um, if, if if you've got any follow up questions, please do pop those in the chat box for us there. Um, we have one more question. So if cats are vomiting through chemo, do you normally prefer meropotent injection, dose reduction, or do you give meropotent tablets off license for these cases? Um, for cats, basically, I don't see a lot of vomiting cats except with vincristine. OK, and in that situation, I would go initially, I'd start with my injection 
for the cat um, and dose reduction and or substitution. I now, honestly and truthfully, would go straight to vinblastin with cats. Um, obviously, this talk's not about cats, it's about dogs, but um, with the, the latest data shows that 42% of cats will vomit with vincristine. OK, and that's a pretty high percentage in my mm. book. That's that's higher than I'd like to see. But if you substitute for vinblastin, you can drop it to 10 percent. So wow. personally, I tend to come in straight away with a cat on vinblastin rather than vincristine on my CHOP. And also I tend to substitute my toxantrone for doxorubicin in cats because they're a little bit more prone to the nephrotoxicity effects of doxorubicin. So by substituting, I try and avoid those problems. Um, but yeah, I, I would use meropotent if I have to, but I would rather get control by other mechanisms if I can. But yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the questions we've had sent through. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed this evening and there will be um, CPD certificates sent out and the, there's also been a recording which we'll share with all of you as well. Okay, have a lovely evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye everyone. <laughs>